Um, now my job uh, is the very long title, um, but Head of Partnerships is about finding ways in which the Imperial War Museum can work in partnership, as the title suggests, with organisations uh, the length and breadth of the country and indeed the world to help tell your stories of, um, the, of, of the, in this case, the First World War, um, but we're, we branch out a little bit to tell the story of history from 1914. Um, and really dig down and, and, and find ways to use what IWM has to tell stories we can't tell on our site. We've got a, we've got a very fixed, um, a, a fixed geography. We can't do everything we absolutely want to do. Um, and so we like to find ways in which we can continue to tell as many stories as possible to improve public understanding of, in this case, the First World War. So, that's all. Um, <coughs> we, uh, at the moment, one of our biggest partnership projects is to run the First World War Centenary Partnership. And I know a number of you in this room will be members of the Centenary Partnership, and I hope those who aren't may take the opportunity to sign up um, before the end of the day. Um, and it's free as well, and I will go through a little bit in what, about why the Imperial War Museum de decided to take this approach through the centenary um, and hopefully find ways in which um, you will find it um, and ways we can work together over the course of not just 2018 but, but moving beyond um, November 2018 as well. Um, but our purpose, as I said, is to, um, is to use the things that we have at the Imperial War Museum <coughs> Um, our staff knowledge and expertise, so yes our curatorial knowledge um, but also the knowledge of some of our PhD students, um, some of our staff who, who have um, experience in different areas of working um, and including some of our um, staff who look at, at, at community research. So this is a, we're working here with a, a local group to us at the Imperial War Museum in London who were investigating a Zeppelin raid that took place in 1917, almost a bit two streets away from the Imperial War Museum. And they wanted to come in, look at some of the records and some of the collections that we had in, in our archive, so not our, not our museum collection, but we're, we're also using the archive as well, um, to find out more about the people who lived and experienced that particular part of the conflict in, um, in Camberwell. Um, and they are going to hand the research that they do over, this is a, as a local history group, and hand that research over to a, a kind of youth drama group, and they're putting on a, a play in Burgess Park, based on the individuals who were, who were a part of that, who were experienced that Zeppelin raid, and some of those who died in the Zeppelin raid. Um, and they're going to do that in Burgess Park, which is very close to where um, that took place. So those are the sorts of um, activities that we couldn't possibly do ourselves at the Imperial War Museum, but that we really want to kind of open up what we've got and say, where can you use this? What stories can you tell from our collections, from our archive, um, and working with some of our staff um, as well? Um, the other thing we really want to do is we realise that you know, the Imperial, like Prony, the Imperial War Museum is a really big organisation. And sometimes if we try and coordinate something or we try and, and have a particular focus on something, that means it really supports and illuminates the work of other organisations who are, who are working in the same subject. And we'll go through, um, through the course of the day, some of those focuses that we're going to have over the course of the next 12 months um, and beyond. Um, so we can use our, our kind of... Um, name our National Museum uh, kind of facilitating ability to be able to pull something together that's bigger than the sum of its parts. But um, the main way in which you can uh, kind of interact with the First World Centenary Partnership and the main way in which you kind of access the things that we've got available um, is through 1914.org. Um, and then specifically for those who sign up as members, and this is where we got very imaginative with the uh, website, uh, members.1914.org. 1914.org um, is a public-facing website for the Centenary, and it's run by, by us as the Centenary Partnerships team. Um, on there, there is, as you can see, um, it's where we promote individual partners' programmes and projects. It's where we um, feature the uh, events calendar, which we, we do in partnership with Culture24, um, so that it's just dropped off the end of this screenshot, but below there is a really long events calendar. As you sign up your events, you tag them and they turn up in different um, for, for different searches. 
that's going to be a really important facility as we come into 2018. So partly so you can see what other people are doing and can make sure that there's not two events in the same place at the same time. Um, but see who else is interested in the sorts of subjects that you are in, the sorts of areas of research um, or, um, or work that you're doing. Um, the events calendar will also include tags so you can look at some of these focuses that we'll have over the course of the year. Um, the news and project, we have a, a kind of news page on here, but we do a, a, an e-newsletter as well, which is a nice way of being able to showcase some of the um, more unusual or extraordinary projects that have taken place. And again, another way of going, oh, that's quite interesting. I wonder if we could do that where we are. Um, it's all about sharing kind of information and good practice. You'll notice that there's a, sec there's a section at the top called, uh, one of the sets of pages is about Passchendaele, and that's because... Um, this year, that was one of our main fo major focuses, was to mark the centenary in Passchendaele. And it gives a good example of where we can do something which acts as a, as a way into exploring other people's work um, and where we can share some of our collections to help, again, illuminate and support what work other people are doing as well. Um, so for the centenary in Passchendaele, although the Imperial War Museum was involved in a lot of some of the official commemorations and we put together uh, the material for the BBC's output on the, um, on the 31st of July. So a lot of, almost most of that was our material and our curators helping um, make sure no mistakes were made uh, when it was projected onto the clock hole. Um, what we did with the Centenary Partnership is my colleague Liz here created a, a film for social media that was about two and a half minutes long using um, moving, using film and images from our collection with a simple narrative which explained why we, as the Imperial War Museum, but all of the organisations and individuals with whom we work are wanting in some way to mark the centenary of Passchendaele and tell that story um, a little bit more. The, the end of that film, if you've not seen it, is a, it kind of leads into this page where people can explore some of those projects. Um, that film has had 150,000 views on social media, which our digital engagement team just keep looking at me as if, like, this is, this is really good. I don't know, because I've never done it before. Um, but apparently that's good. So we're taking that idea, and that's something we're going to roll into 2018 and look at some of the, the important centenaries um, in 2018, where we know a number of members of Centenary Partnership are working and do the same sort of similar call to action, again, using our collection. But the critical one for us is partnership. Um, if you sign up as a, as a member of the Centenary Partnership, there is any number of um, resources and uh, kind of helpful uh, things that we've put together. And we've built this since 2013, so now it's an enormously rich resource. Um, like I said, the Centenary Partnership is free to join. We've got just over 3,800 members, most from the UK. Um, but they're actually from 62 countries around the world as well. So it's a, it's a really big uh, digital community. Um, there's the purpose of us, <coughs> of us deciding that this is the way in which we wanted to work was, as I said, we cannot tell and we shouldn't tell every single story um, of the First World War. It's um, far more, uh, it has far greater impact if different people can explain from their perspectives why something happened or how something happened or uncover some of those hidden histories and hidden stories um, and we find ways in which to support that. The main way in which we've done is through our resources and resource packs. The Imperial War Museum has a vast collection and some of that collection will be replicated in, if you hear from museums or libraries or archives, will be replicated in, in those. Um, and in some cases they're replicated in what people have in their own personal collections. Um, but we've got some which are quite remarkable. Um, and we know that that's the, the demand from not just the, the sort of museum, cultural heritage sector, but from individual organisations as well, community history groups. And they come to us and say, and ask us, this is what we're doing, do you have any extra information on? Or do you have context material about this? Or can your curators help us um, with some other kind of, uh, kind of national context for something? Or could we have access to images or films? Um, so we're taking some of, the, um, some, of the, some of those unique collections at the Imperial War Museum, our film collection, some of our sound archives and sound recordings, um, our archive, um, which includes kind of letters and ephemera and things like that. 
Um, and the images of our art collection, we've got a remarkable art collection. Um, and so we've got some uh, digitised images of some of the um, First World War works, important First World War, War First World War works. That is a tongue twister for our <laughs> topic, that really is. Um, that we have made as part of um, as part of this. The resource packs um, we put together. We do the kind of pre-selection and the pre-curation of those, so we have them around the things that we most commonly get asked. So you don't have to spend time filtering through our vast collections online to try and find the thing that you want. Um, that you know, if you do want a, a, a sort of a I don't know, just a, a picture that, that shows, gives the context of women in the First World War. Trust us, we've gone through that whole collection for you and picked out um, 40 or so images that you can use that are free to use, that are copyright free, that as long as you um, don't use them for commercial purposes, we're really interested to see how different people use our collection in different ways. So the resource packs tend to be themed around um, things that are kind of com common themes. Um, so we've had those through different historic um, events, but we've also got them through um, different uh, through different uh, themes as well. And the biggest one of those um, that we're building at the moment is around women in the First World War. There's also on here um, uh, how-to guides, for, um, toolkits. There's downloadable exhibitions. There's and big posters that we're putting together for you to display um, and there is a there's a way a database where you can search all the other members organizations so you can find out who they are um, and again that shows some of the variety if, as you dig around the websites um, I mentioned the focuses and um, this will talk a little bit more about our bigger project which is around about women in the first world war but suffice to say we're using our women's work collection um, which is, a, again, an important collection to the Imperial War Museum, but one we've not used um, or shared um, in any sort of uh, coordinated way before. This is just one of my favorite. There are dozens and dozens of these amazing <laughs> photographs of women's war work, and um, we currently <coughs> plastered around our office trying to pick out the ones we want to use as lead images. Um, but this is the sort of material that we can make available to you. Um, and then as we move towards through... To, through uh, 2018, um, we'll look at having, as I mentioned, focuses um, through the year, backing these up with a mixture of us providing some sort of um, access and element to our collections, um, mixed with us looking at where we could work more strategically in partnership with organisations. Um, clearly, um, as we move towards the centenary the end of the conflict, um, one of the things we're very keen to, to work with organisations on is about the local impact of our missus to peace and return and what happened next because that's the theme of our big exhibition at the Imperial War Museum um, but we we are very restricted in space, you have to find out amount of space in an exhibition so uh, it's our job to try and tell a much broader, fuller story um, of the conclusion of the First World War. We're also looking at the Spring Offensive over the summer, looking at telling lesser told stories of the First World War, um, and then looking a little bit at how people have remembered across the centenary. Um, as we, because we, as I mentioned, we'll keep going beyond the 11th of November, um, and because this is such a core part of how we work in partnership with different organisations. Um, so if you want to get in touch with us, please tell us what you're what you're doing. Um, please uh, ask us questions. Please, um, if you need to find out more information about the Centre in your partnership, um, this is myself, Liz, and Pamela's email addresses. I really recommend using the bottom one because that gets to all three of us, um, and that gets checked um, every day. So hopefully that will be the easiest way to get hold of us. Um, but please do talk to us today. Please do tell us what um, what you're doing. Please see where we might be able to help and work with you and use our collection. And Liz, seamlessly moving on, um, is going to talk about the first of those focuses, which is our Women's Work 100 project. Well, by way of introduction, the Women Trust is a conservation organisation. And it was founded in 1972 by a chap called Ken Watkins. Ken Watkins was a businessman and lived in the southwest of England. And if we go back to the late 60s and the early 70s, there was quite a lot of development happening in the in the southwest of England. Uh, there was a lot of motorway construction near the M5, the M4, 
uh, and the M6 up towards the Midlands with a lot of development of housing and expansion of housing in and around the Bristol area and down in Exeter. And Ken was very, very concerned that native trees and woodland was disappearing from the British landscape. So he jumped on the train back in 72, headed to London uh, and to the equivalent of the charity commissioners today uh, and registered the organisation as conservation organisation. And it was slightly different to other conservation organisations at the time in that most organisations tended to be organised on a county by county basis in England. So we, we had the Wildlife Trust being organised at the time. But Ken felt that woodland was so, so important that you just couldn't look at it in, in the context of the southwest of England. So when he registered the charity in London, he had written into the deeds that it would embrace the territories of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And in fact, that was 72. And like all charities uh, strapped for funding, uh, it, it was a bit of a struggle to actually realize his dream or his vision. Uh, and the organisation slowly crept up through England, into Wales, into Scotland. And then in 1996, uh, it eventually created the last piece of the jigsaw with the establishment of an office here in Northern Ireland in Bangor, uh, where we are now celebrating our 21 years in the province. Uh, so as such, we've come of age. And it's interesting when you look at it, and that's looking at the figures, that in those 21 years, the Trust has invested £20 million in Northern Ireland alone, and most of that funding has been raised from a small office in Dufferin Avenue in Bangor. So it's spent £20 million in the last 21 years. Uh, we now own a thousand woods, uh, 50 of those are in Northern Ireland, all of them have got free public access, and we are essentially a membership organisation, so we, we benefit from having very generous uh, members, uh, and members and supporters numbers are currently sitting at 500,000, so we have half a million supporters right across the United Kingdom. Uh, of which 15,000 are based here in Northern Ireland. So we were absolutely delighted when we were first asked if we would do something, something around the centenary, uh, a way of marking the sacrifice made by, by, by so many. Uh, although, with all things Northern Ireland, once an idea is, is born, there is a problem. And the problem for us is that we could not just celebrate, commemorate uh, First World War in a Northern Ireland on a Northern Ireland basis. That to really do justice to all of those Irish people who lost their lives, it had to be on an All Ireland basis. So it had to embrace uh, the Republic of Ireland as, as well. Uh, and, and that was very quickly adopted and very quickly accepted not just by the powers that be here in Northern Ireland, but also by members of the Irish government who we went to and spoke to about the actual project. And what we're doing is, we're hoping to create a commemorative wood in each of the four countries, which will reflect the sacrifice and seek, seek to, to attract people who want to reflect on the sacrifices made by so many uh, during the First World War. We were very, very fortunate in that as we were thinking of this project, we were coming out of another project and we had, we had done a project to commemorate the, Her Majesty's Diamond Jubilee. And for Her Majesty's Diamond Jubilee, we had done something similar. We had created four woods, one in each of the four countries. Uh, and we were very fortunate to have the Princess Royal as our, our patron. So coming to the end of the project, the Princess Royal was to come to the end of her tenure as a patron, but when we told her the story of, of our hopes in respect of the First World War, she agreed to stay on until the end of 2018. So she is our official patron, and in Northern Ireland in 2014 uh, to launch the initiative. And for the initiative, we've identified an area of land in the Fochan Valley, 
And the Fawn Valley is an area uh, about six miles southeast of Derry, London Derry, Stroke City, call it what you wish. Uh, but it is an area that I liken to a Hollywood actress, in that it has more gongs than a Hollywood actor or actress, in that it is an area of special scientific interest, which is a national designation, the UK designation, uh, but it is also designated as a special area of conservation, uh, which is a European designation. And it has been designated primarily because the River Fahan runs through the actual site and in fact uh, has, supports a salmon population, supports otters, there are red squirrels, uh, so in fact it, it is a, a very special area in terms of nature conservation. So in the Fahan Valley, uh, to deliver our project in 2013 we bought 53 acres of land which was to be our commemorative wood. As we started to develop the project, so also did our ambitions grow, and we felt that there was a greater opportunity and there was a greater constituency of support for what we wanted to do. So in fact today, the 53 acres sits within a complex of 180 acres of land, uh, which the Trust will develop as its commemorative wood. And at the heart of the actual wood, will be an area which will be uh, a commemorative area which will tell the story of the various Irish regiments who served so bravely during that time between 1914-1918. Uh, uh, so to do this we have actually employed, uh, and some of you will be uh, familiar with the, the name Dawson Stelfox, who is a prominent Belfast architect, and Dawson is designing what would be an amphitheatre uh, at the heart of the wood and visitors to the wood would be led to the amphitheatre by way of a poetry trail uh, and uh, another well-known poet Sam Burnside from the northwest has written a book of verse that book of verse will be inscribed on pieces of stone leading from the car park to the commemorative area uh, so that people will have something to draw them into, into the actual site. But the, the project is also about people and what we are keen to do and historians will differ uh, and I'm not a historian so I will bow to their better knowledge as to how many Irish lives were actually lost in the First World War. I'm told by some historians it was 30,000, some tell me it was 50,000, others tell me it's impossible to say because there is no list of those who served with other regiments other than Irish regiments. So, uh, being a conservation organisation we've gone for the middle ground and we have uh, set ourselves a task of planting 40,000 trees, one for each Irish life lost and, and should the historians prove us wrong, we have actually bought some more land so that we can up the, the, up the actual figures. And it's interesting, interesting to see that, you know, of the 40,000 trees that we intend to plant on the site, uh, we've already planted 27,500. Most of those have been planted by children, and children not just in Northern Ireland, but from schools across the border in, in County Donegal. Uh, and, and it's hoped that by the end of 2018 we will have planted the extra 12,500 to bring us up to the 40,000 because we are under threat from Her Royal Highness as she left the site in 2014 in true Schwarzenegger fashion she turned around and said I'll be back mm -hmm. so we, the, the push is on to make sure that all trees are in place but the project is about events and I was very interested to hear about the events page uh, in that we have <coughs> over the last four years uh, as part of the Remembrance Weekend been holding events on the site which are growing in popularity and, and are actually becoming a diary date and we're very very lucky that we have 
the Chelsea pensioners who for the last four years have come. They're probably the most photographed people in Northern Ireland on that weekend. Uh, as, and along with that, we've had a lot of the regimental associations like the Irish Guards who have been very keen to actually come and, and, and plant trees and some of the uni uniform organisations such as Scouts, Boys Brigade, Boys Brigade, Brigade etc. So, when we started the project, uh, the reduced project, uh, we set ourselves a budget of a million pounds. And the problem of having an influent, influential committee, uh, and our, our committee is headed up by the Lord Lieutenant for County Londonderry, Mr Dennis Desmond, and is supported by His Grace the Duke of Abercorn. And the problem of having a, a, such distinguished people on your committee is that they keep raising the bar. So our project that started off as a million pound project, uh, with their pushing and nudging, has now become a 1.5 million pound project. As I said, it's increased from the 50 odd acres to embrace 180 acres in the valley. Uh, and indeed, we expect that it will even grow further. So in fact, from a million it jumped to 1.5 million, uh, from 1.5 million, I expect by the year 2023, it'll, it'll have jumped up to £2 million. And of that £1.5 million that we're currently working to, uh, we have raised £1 million in the last three years in Northern Ireland and, and abroad. And that has come from a variety of sources, you know. It's come from our main sponsor, is Sainsbury's and Sainsbury's into our UK initiative is putting in four million pounds uh, and we will get our, our, our share of that here in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's come from individuals, it's come from groups such as the Honourable the Irish Society and the River Fawn is actually owned by the Honourable the Irish uh, and it's come from just ordinary people who have attended an event who believe in what we, we are trying to achieve uh, and, and, and have dug deep into their pockets uh, to actually help us to do that. So we have a balance of half a million to raise and we are confident based on our, 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 our record in the last three years that we will raise that half million. We've currently got a bid with the Irish government because as an all-island initiative, we feel that the Irish government should be actually supporting it. Uh, we've got a number of opportunities in the private sector with corporates to bring them on board. Uh, and I have no doubt that it will be, it'll be successful. So really, it's about create, creating an area, a natural living uh, environment, that will do justice to the sacrifice of so many on our behalf, but also be an opportunity for people today to learn about the efforts that were made by those and to actually visit the site and reflect and commemorate and enjoy. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Victoria Miller and I'm the curator of HMS Caroline. Um, as with the other speakers today, I'd like to extend my thanks to the Imperial War Museum and Promi for inviting me to speak to you today about HMS Caroline. Um, for those of you who maybe don't know too much about the ship, um, HMS Caroline is a type of ship called a light cruiser. She was built by Camel Laird of Darkenhead in 1914 and she is the sole survivor of the Battle of Jutland. Um, after a period of service in the East Indies after the First World War, Caroline came to Belfast in 1924, uh, where she has remained ever since. And then in 2016, she reopened as a floating museum and heritage attraction. Between 1924 and up until 2009, she served as drill ship for the Ulster Division of the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. So in terms of anyone who doesn't really know much about Caroline and where she is, she's actually just down the road, um, just past Titanic Belfast and the Titanic Studios were on the left hand side, so uh, right in the heart of Titanic Quarter here. 
Um, the key supporters for the project to restore Caroline and make her into um, a floating museum and heritage attraction were the Heritage Lottery Fund, the Department for the Economy, Tourism Northern Ireland and the National Heritage Memorial Fund. So all those key supporters helped us to uh, restore the ship. Um, in terms of the plan to restore Caroline and the area around the ship, um, it has been split into three phases. So phase one um, was focusing on the ship, so restoring the ship to make it a place for visitors to uh, come to. So that involves a lot of asbestos removal, adapting the ship itself, putting in new audiovisual equipment, an exhibition fit out, and that all finished then in June um, 2016. And then we went on to phase two of the project, which started in late October 2016, which was dry docking the ship uh, for conservation works <laughs> in the hull. And then phase three, which we're currently in at the minute, um, is works to the visitor centre, uh, which um, will be uh, in Titanic Dock and Pump House, the Pump House section. <coughs> so that's next to Caroline and Alexandra Dock. Um, that's ongoing at the minute. And then landscaping around the dock itself. So this is a photograph of Caroline before restoration. So taken a few years ago. And you can see how um, she was a bit worse for wear at that stage. Um, a bit of a more close-up shot shows um, a lot of rust to um, the external paintwork and so forth. Um, again, another photograph of, uh, during the restoration uh, showing uh, some of the uh, degradation that occurred to the sea work um, on the, the deck. So quite a lot of work to restore the ship. And again, this is a catch-all underneath one of the portholes. Um, so a lot of work to be done to bring her back up to standard. Um, during the restoration, the project team uncovered a number of interesting finds, one of which being original tiles uh, from the First World War. And visitors can now see these in a number of locations on board, including the captain's pantry. Um, these are just some photographs of the restoration work taking place. So welding works occurring, and um, some repairs being made to the state work as well on board. So um, it was a very uh, intensive period of time during the early part of 2016 to get ready for um, the official opening, uh, which took place on the 31st of May last year um, to coincide with the centenary of the Battle of Jutland. Um, the next day then we opened to the public on the 1st of June. And here are some of the um, restored spaces on board. Um, this is the Marines' mess set to look as though um, Caroline's 29 Royal Marines have just stepped out for a moment just before they're having their meal. And then another um, restored space on board um, is one of Caroline's historic galleys. And you can see there are a couple of visitors using um, the audio guide, um, which is given to visitors when they board the ship. And it's a self-guided visit where you can take your time, go around the ship at leisure, and stop off at various locations on board and listen to uh, information about the space you're looking at. In conjunction with a number of the historic spaces on board, other spaces have been fitted out as contemporary exhibition spaces. Um, so you can see here the Torpedo School. Um, these spaces really give a break from the historic spaces on board and give families and groups an opportunity to explore other um, stories relating to the ship um, and take part in interactive activities as well. So as I mentioned there, phase two of the project then kicked off at the um, end of October 2016. And Caroline then was towed off uh, to dry dock. Thankfully, <coughs> she didn't have to go too far, less than a mile around to Harland and Wolf dry dock. Um, so um, it was a bit of a uh, worrying day that day in terms of was she going to make it round, but luckily she did. And um, one of the key um, uh, focuses of the dry docking was to uh, carry out conservation works to the hull. And this photograph was taken um, during the early stages of the dry docking when um, the workers had the uh, rather unpleasant task of scraping off all the marine growth. Um, I was there at that time and it really smelt. It wasn't a very nice place to be uh, when they were scraping all that off. Um, but once they did, uh, they were able to identify uh, various rivets that needed repair in areas of the ship's hull um, that needed to be conserved um, in order for her to last again in the water for a number of years to come. And then the ship's hull was all repainted and uh, cathodic protection was added to the ship's hull as well, again to prolong the life of the hull before we would have to go back into dry dock again. Uh, Caroline then returned to Alexandra Dock in December 
2016, and you can see there a really lovely day for her to come back in, in December. It looks like a summer's day where um, she was towed back into position in Alexandria Rock. And then um, we remained closed for the early part of 2017 um, to allow for um, works to be um, undertaken on the dock side, including a new permanent mooring system for the ship. So um, Caroline is now attached to the dock side with two um, triangular shaped arms that you can see being installed here early, earlier in this year. Um, so those works took place. We then reopened to the public in July this year. Um, however, works are still ongoing into 2018. Um, a lot of work is uh, taking place around the dock side, recobbling the dock, um, which you can see here. <coughs> And the other main project that's taken place at the minute is the um, uh, modifications being made to three blocks of the pump house. So the block you see on the left hand side, the larger block, that will be a ticketing space so visitors will buy their tickets in uh, block three. They'll then head through into block two, <coughs> the first gallery of which will be called HMS Caroline Her Story. So we explore the history of the ship from construction right through to present day. So bringing in other stories associated with the ship, such as East Indies and then her time in Belfast. And then block one on the right hand side um, is called HMS Caroline Meet Her People, which will give visitors a chance to get to know some of the crew members who um, were on the ship during the First World War before they head out to the ship and have a look around there. Um, also, before the project money runs out, we're doing a number of additional works to the ship. Um, for those of you who have maybe visited the ship before, you might have noticed that one of the engine rooms, um, the turbines in that space, have been uh, coated in a wax oil substance by a professional conservator. And we're hoping to do the same then to engine room number two um, in, the, in the new year, as well as various works to the platform deck that visitors currently don't get access to. So again, conservation work to those spaces as well on board. Um, in terms of some of the projects then, the First World War projects we have done, um, whether it be events um, or the like, uh, one of the um, key things that I do obviously on board and I reach sessions is to go out and talk about the ship and the history associated um, with Caroline. And one of the things we've been working on over the last <coughs> year is a Meet the Crew tour. Um, we were recently very lucky to receive a donation of postcard photographs from the First World War. <coughs> Um, of various um, HMS Caroline First World War crew members and they were made even more significant by the fact that they have um, the names of the men uh, associated with the postcard photographs so they weren't just faceless uh, or, or unknown uh, people just in a photograph so it was luckily we had these names and what we then did was make use of the Lives of First World War database there's an HMS Caroline community on there and we took all the details from that. There's around about 240 names linked to HMS Caroline at the Battle of Jutland. And we were then able to marry up some of the names that we had on postcard photographs um, with the details um, on the website here. And then the best uh, thing you can get out of this is that you can actually then view the service records of the men. And um, there's some really interesting pieces of information from the service records that we were able to glean. Um, even things such as uh, certain crew members had tattoos and there was one in particular, one of the ship's um, chefs, who um, he had a number of tattoos um, of Australia, he must have had a connection, there was it mentioned that he had a tattoo of a kangaroo and so forth. And then it's also interesting as well, it ma makes a reference to if any of the men spent any time in cells. And um, when we did our research we realised that quite a lot of the stokers on board spent time in cells. So I don't know what that says to the stokers, but they seem to be the ones getting in trouble. And then I use that information then to do the Meet the Crew tour. So we go around the ship with a group of um, people. Uh, we stop off at various locations on board. Uh, we talk about some of the crew members that were inhabiting those spaces during the First World War. So during the audio guide, you'll hear quite a lot about the captain in the captain's quarters. But what we do on the tour then is talk about the captain's steward, A.P. Smith. Um, we go down into the wardroom and talk about the um, wardroom steward, uh, Frank Scholes. So getting to know a bit more about some of the crew members that you don't necessarily hear about on the audio guide. Um, another project we have been working on recently <coughs> is um, Through the Eyes of a Boy, which uh, we completed a couple of weeks ago. Um, it is an immersive theatre performance on Caroline based on the diaries of William Crick. 
who was a boy telegraphist on board the ship. And we worked in conjunction with Amateur Dramatic Society Beaver Players to really bring extracts of the diary to life in an immersive theatre performance on board the ship. So that's another project we were involved with. And um, not only are myself involved in these projects, um, the ship's uh, learning and engagement team are heavily involved as well. Um, Positive Aging Month last year, they uh, put together a drawing day um, inspired by various historic spaces on board the ship um, for people to get involved with that. And then they also ran a Make Do and Men <coughs> workshop based on First World War patterns as well. Another thing they, they do as well, the Learning and Engagement team has put together lecture series. Um, they held a First World War lecture series earlier this year, and this one was uh, focusing on Irish women in the First World War. And this is my last slide. It essentially shows the ship, um, the artist's impression of how um, the pump house and the ship will look once all the work is complete. Um, hopefully all of the work will be completed um, around Easter 2018. Um, so we'll have um, a lovely new dockside, the ship uh, with its new mooring system, and then the galleries as well next to the ship to add to the stories we're already telling on board. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm Mike King from Down County Museum, um, curator of the museum. It's an old jail, and they let me out today to talk to you. Uh, it's a jail from, uh, it was a jail from 1790 to, uh, to 1830, and then it was a barracks, in fact, from about 1850 to the end of the Second World War. So it's got a long military history itself, and it's been a museum since 1981. Um, so our project is a decade of centenaries project, and it's been a long time in the making, and it's still not there yet. It's an ongoing project, so this is really an update on progress. But um, this this hut at Ballykimmer Camp was dismantled about five years ago, and it's an extinct species now, the Ballykimmer hut, I think, except for two examples. Carol has one at the Song Centre and has been successfully re-erected, and ours is still in a field. And we've been waiting to get money to, to, to rebuild it. And we've been successful now to get EU um, Peace 4 funding, which is a shared spaces funding to rebuild it. Um, which will partly it will rebuild the, the hut and also it will pay for an engagement uh, program with the local community and also the wider heritage community in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So um, it's very much um, a project along the lines. Um, that, that William was speaking about. In, in, in fact, we'd like multiple perspectives to, to be sort of represented in this hut when it's in, in the, the museum. So that was a very nice phrase, really. Um, the camp um, dates back at least to 1899, um, to the period of the Boer War. And uh, originally it was used by regiments who would go there and uh, camp with tents, and then huts were constructed. The type of huts uh, that we're looking at are the Armstrong huts. And um, we know that some of them were still being built in the First World War. So when a war broke out in September and uh, volunteers started joining up, um, they started coming down to first Newcastle and in December, by December there were a number of regiments or battalions of the 36th Ulster um, uh, Division in the, uh, in the camp here. We know that the 8th, 9th, 10th and 11th battalions, you know, all raised in Belfast, were there um, from December onwards. Uh, we know the stories of, of a few of them, and we're trying to gather the life stories of, of, of some of the soldiers who are in, in the camp. Um, Philip Orr has done a very nice job. Um, obviously, his road to the song is a classic, and we're going to mine that for some fantastic stories for soldiers to represent in, in the hut. Um, and he's also done a little book for, for us. Um, this was part of our Peace 3 project on uh, the early decades of, of the camp, um, which covers you know, the period we're looking at in particular, which is the First World War, but also the, the time of internment in 1920 to 21, uh, when IRA man, men and suspects were rounded up from all over Ireland and shipped into this place um, without being charged and were kept in the camp for about a year. 1920 to 21. <coughs> so we have very rich veins of information, you know, coming to us from soldiers' diaries and artifacts, uh, letters and postcards, but also the autograph books and um, images, letters and documents relating to the internment period. So 
really this, the hut that we're going to be putting up is sort of coming of age in a few years' time. And uh, we are going to be telling the whole story um, and representing other people who've occupied the hut through its hundred years history, really. Um, really, we're very much indebted to um, uh, Andrew Carlyle, who's really, really sort of got this project moving for us, and he um, recruited a territorial army unit to kind of dismantle our hut for us and um, put it in a field. Uh, that's what it looks like when it's had its corrugated iron taken off. Um, it was dismantled in sections, and uh, there we are. Interestingly, when they dug underneath, they discovered in the sand lots of artefacts, so we hadn't expected this. So there was a sort of a, an unexpected archaeological dig that took place underneath. And we found a lot of things, um, not many from the First World War period, but uh, quite a lot from the Second World War and since. Um, there's toothpaste there, well lost the rifles, insignia. These are, I think, targets from the, the, the range. Uh, plates, RAF plates there. Beer bottles, plenty of beer bottles from Dan Patrick. Um, and this is the hut that was successfully moved to the Somme Centre uh, by the Somme Association about five years ago. And uh, so two huts were, were saved. I think three, in fact. I think you, Carol managed to put together a hut from two because obviously they're not in a great state. Uh, we have one, and we have a lot of repairs to do to it. Um, and it's also suffered a bit from from uh, being stored for uh, five years, so we're glad we've got funding now. There it is in a field, uh, in Anne-Marie Dillon's field in Balakinla, and uh, looking out over to the Moor Mountains, and it's looked after by Anne's horse, uh, who also lives in the field. And uh, we, we meet every time we go and check it. Um, it's going to go into the jail. Uh, as I said, it was a, a barracks for some time, over 100 years. You can see that there, there are, there are uh, cells on the left and a governor's residence on the right. We're going to put it into that area. It's only going to be temp a temporary uh, building. And it's a temporary building. We've got planning permission uh, for three to six years. And it's not going to be there forever. So it's not going to affect the Georgian building in the longer term. So we do want to construct it in a way that it can be dismantled and taken somewhere else. Um, we're going to think about where that, where that is. But you can see where it goes in the center of the complex there. Um, and it has to have all kinds of um, new elements like a ramp, um, health and safety. Um, and that's what it looks like uh, in plan or in the, against the buildings. Um, so you can see that the jail is quite a, an extensive complex, um, dating back to you know, 1789. And um, this is actually an image around about the Second World War period. And you can see that there was a a Nissan hut, in fact, in the central courtyard where we're going to put the Armstrong hut. So that's a nice piece of uh, evidence that they, they were used in the place. And also there's an Armstrong hut in the corner there um, uh, on, on the left-hand uh, side. So um, it's going to be an addition to the interpretation we offer. We're also going to use one of the wings of the cell block as additional interpretation. So we don't really want to make this into a, a gallery as such. We want to make it into a hut that you enter to experience what it was like um, you know, in that decade. This is an example uh, of um, a hut at uh, Cannock Chase that I visited earlier in the year. And uh, this is the same sort of type, uh, six windows. Uh, what they've done there is to make it into a partly a reconstruction and partly a, an exhibition area. Uh, very well done, very interesting. Um, so we're inspired by some of the props and the um, real artefacts they have on display there, including this stove. I'm looking for a stove. <laughs> um, and all of the equipment of a soldier there. Um, and these, these trestle or truckle beds, uh, which could be laid out and moved around quite easily. And the planks could be, uh, could be used for, for other purposes, as we'll see later. But uh, I'd like the, uh, the hut to be something you'd experience you know, you know, as, as somebody going back 100 years. But we're going to allocate beds to different people. So the beds are going to represent life stories of, of soldiers and internees, and in fact other people who are in the camps. Um, these are pictures of camps, other camps like uh, Finna and Randall's Town. You can see they put their beds outside sometimes and lay in the sun during a break. Um, 
this is how they might have been uh, laid out with their beds and their equipment. Um, this is very useful for you know identifying fittings that we can put in. Um, soldiers at leisure. So we're looking for we're looking for this kind of material from Balakinla. So we're putting out the the uh, you know the the call now and uh, very much we're, we're at a development phase of it. These are the sort of things we're looking for, and we're looking to digitize them. So we, we don't expect to show a lot of original artifacts in this. Uh, we, we really want to sort of provide maybe a portal on our website which will uh, maybe access digitized images all over Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, um, and help to digitize artifacts and, and, in, and uh, archives elsewhere that haven't been done. Um, so this is the camp we know that uh, some of the soldiers were building some of the huts in 1914-15. Uh, Philip Orr tells a great story about Tommy Irvin, one of the soldiers of the 8th Battalion, um, who was actually involved in building some of the huts. And, of course, uh, he was involved in building tr uh, trenches, uh, practice trenches, which have been excavated for the last few years. And uh, Heather Montgomery was telling us all about that at a, at a lecture in the museum um, a few weeks ago. So there is actually archaeology there, relating to the practice trenches at that time. And of course all these soldiers then, uh, they paraded through uh, Belfast on May the 8th, 1915, and by July most of them had the trenches, and a year later many of them fell at the Battle of the Somme. So this is a very significant place where the soldiers were trained. This is the Sands home, which goes back to about 1901, which was a home which was really to um, provide a, rec a place of recreation um, along a biblical model um, uh, for some of the soldiers to look after them uh, during their stay there because they weren't really allowed to go home. Uh, some of them did try. Uh, they weren't far from home. Um, but uh, they called it the World's End um, because it's on the coast of County Down. It's on the southeast coast of the Kale, sort of southeast of, um, sorry, southwest of uh, the Kale. Southwest of Dunpatrick. Mm -hmm. What we've also discovered is, a, you know, a very rich vein of material relating to the internment. So, in November uh, 1920, um, <coughs> there were, uh, 14 uh, British agents were killed in Dublin by Michael Collins's men, and at that point, many um, IRA men were brought to Ballykinler. By December 1920, uh, Camp One was uh, was full. And uh, this internment went on until 1921, December 1921. And uh, the men in the huts uh, circulated autograph books. And there are hundreds of these in different museums. And they record quite a lot about the life there. Uh, the same huts the soldiers are, had occupied. And you can see there what they look like inside. Uh, the same trestle beds and so on. These are some of the, 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 the drawings. They, they come up with. We have one of the books, and we've got one on loan from Kilmainham Jail. I know that there are autograph books in Monaghan Museum, Carlo, Cavan, um, Galway. So there's a very rich uh, vein. I think they're digitizing their 1920-21 material in the National Museum of Ireland as well. Um, a lot of interesting artwork and lists of men in the huts. Um, they had violin classes. So the fellow on the right is uh, Martin Walton, who was from Dublin and uh, started the, the Ballykinla Violin Orchestra. Um, they had their own altar in a, in a chapel in one of the huts. They smuggled a, a camera into the, the huts in a cake, started taking photographs. And uh, they had Irish classes, half an hour Irish class every every night, and put on their own plays. And Philip tells me that one of the plays that they, uh, they put on there was actually put on by the soldiers during the war and by the attorneys, the same play. They had their own money. Uh, some of this has been put in one of the autograph books here. And so these are the two main sources that are going to be very useful to us. You know, the Philip's great book, The Road to the Song, and Prisoners of War, by Liam Dwyer. So, this is going to be very useful for identifying life stories for people we're going to represent in the beds. 
and this is going to be a this is going to be a hut that we would like all communities to explore and find stories they're familiar with and some that they're not familiar with. Uh, you can get this book um, about the first 70 years um, online, uh, but we're going to reprint it shortly as well. If you just put in Dan County Museum Ballykiller Camp, you'll get it. We've also had some very interesting developments. Uh, a lady gave us some photographs of Maltese refugees from the 1940s. So Malta was under, um, it was really um, under siege from 1940 to 1942. And uh, there were 3,000 air raids from the Italy and Italian and German air forces on it. And um, it survived, but um, many of the children were, uh, refu were refugees. Some came to Britain, some came to Ballykinler camp. So these are photographs of Maltese children from uh, who, who've arrived in Ballykinler. We find trying to find more about them because we don't know their names. We also had GIs in the camp, uh, 1942 and three. Uh, the fellow, so in the right-hand photograph, the fellow on the left is Horace Caratelli, and we know all about his route from um, <coughs> Ballykinler camp through to North Africa and then through Italy. And we have a photograph of him standing on the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Uh, which is one of uh, which he, he, he went up on the way north. So we have a, we have an interesting story there, and even more unexpected photographs of the England World Cup team uh, practicing at Ballykinler after their World Cup win in 1966. They're on their way to Windsor Park to play Northern Ireland. I don't know the score. Um, so there's Alf Ramsey. Um, you can see some of the huts behind them yeah, there. I think that might be George Cohen. So I had to get my 1970 World, World, uh, uh, World Cup annual out to find out. <laughs> um, there's uh, Nobby Styles, and that fellow on the right, uh, kicking the ball, is Jackie Charlton. And of course, he's a great hero of uh, English football, but also latterly a great hero of Irish football, being manager of Ireland at one point. Um, you can see the Mourne Mountains, I think, on the left, just behind that fellow on the left there. This locates, you know, the, the camp. Um, and that, I think, might be the first fo photo bomb in history there. <laughs> on the right there. I'm not sure who that is, but I think that's Jeff Hurst on the left for that one. So, I don't know how we're going to incorporate this story, but uh, it's going to be a digital interpretation, I think. And the very interesting thing is, just to finish off, is this uh, lovely watercolour in one of the autograph books of Gaelic football taking place. Uh, they played most afternoons uh, at the camp, 1920-21, and there is Gordon Banks saving a goal, I suppose, um, on the right. So, you know, what we're, what we're looking to do is to make this, um, you know, a very inclusive project. We'd like to build the hut next year. We'd like to fit it out towards the end of the year and open it in 2019. Uh, we can incorporate the story of the war. <coughs> war obviously, it'll be over 100 years you know, from the end of the war, but it will be before the, the time of internment, the, cent the centenary, centenary of the time of internment. So we'll be looking, it'll be the time of the peace process, I suppose, a hundred years ago, uh, after the First World War, um, uh, Versailles, and uh, we'll be looking to bring in, uh, I suppose, visitors and tourists um, to explore this for all over UK and Republic of Ireland in the summer of 2019. So I hope that gives you an idea. I hope we can do what I've said. Um, the money's there, and now all we need to do is, is make all the contacts and bring all the material together. So it's a call for help, really. If you, if you have any uh, sources of information about Ballykinder, we'd just love to see it, and we'd love to help you make, make it accessible, if, you, if you'd like, like us to do that. Thanks very much. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about 10 minutes and I'm just going to say a few highlights of things that Cody's done over the last year and then I'm going to mention a few highlights of things that we hope to do next year. Pass of denial and then we're going to talk impromptu um, about um, a collaboration we did together. So I'm not sure how that one's going to work out. So um, Cody's big strengths are one, 
we're an archive, which means um, we have a heck of a lot of material related to the First World War. And First World War is on the creation of the Northern Ireland State, and this whole period that's known as the Decade of St. Andrews is one of our big, big strengths, which is why the likes of Nile will steal our routine, they steal our um, images. The second um, thing we bring to the table is the, this facility itself, the built, um, the, the built um, prony, um, where we can house events like that. I suppose the third thing is we tend to say yes to most things. <laughs> so uh, this is a, um, a few, we're going to do whistle stop um, things that we did recently. I mean, we've produced a number of exhibitions. Two of them are out with um, our colleagues from Libraries NI. Um, Constance and Eva has actually got very well travelled. I um, was in Denmark earlier this year. Um, that's me speaking to Danes in our house. Um, it was exhibited in Manchester School of Art. It's also done the tour of, in, I think it's about 13 or 14 libraries now across Northern Ireland as well. Um, in addition, we have a counterpart, which is the First World War, um, which is also a touring on libraries and NI. And there's two or three of the panels also on display upstairs. We've um, contributed to other people's exhibitions. In particular, the one I'd like to sound out most is the one that's the permanent display that's now in City Hall, where the, I think there's 18 rooms um, on the left-hand wing. If you haven't been to see this exhibition, I strongly encourage you to go and see it. We have about two rooms that are kitted out, one of which um, is on the, uh, the Covenant, and this is taken from Prodi's um, web, Covenant website. Um, and in a, throughout, littered throughout that exhibition are exhibits from Prodi. We've held um, numerous um, um, talks, presentations, and conferences. Um, this one was we, we tried to preempt um, the conscription crisis by having a conversation in 2017 rather than 2018. And so we had three tremendous speakers came over, um, two of them from the University of Kent. We've um, celebrated over March of the Russian Revolution, and there's some speakers here today who participated <coughs> in that. And we've also had a good re um, <coughs> relationship with the Western Front Association. Tom seems to have dropped out of the room at the moment. Uh, where um, we've held monthly uh, talks to mark um, various aspects of the First World War, um, and that's a very prolific um, relationship. Um, we've looked at um, some things which are a bit less obvious, like the Balfour Declaration, and we have supported um, um, the Battlefields um, Initiative, which um, the Psalm Centre also have contributed to. Um, that was, I think we gave about 30,000 um, pounds to send children um, to various schools um, across France and Belgium. That's um, stalled a bit whilst um, there's money not coming from Stormen um, at the moment, but we have sent a number of schools out of the Department of Communities in conjunction with the Department of Education. And you'll be hearing about this later, so I'm not going to say much about it, but Pony's contribution to the project with Campbell College is very much on the preservation side. So that's another facet of things that we do. We digitize, we preserve, um, and we make things um, accessible for the future. Um, so just a few things next year. You've heard talk about suffrage. Pony will be doing something on suffrage, as I know Belfast City Council and others around the room will be doing. Um, we'll be holding our event on the day, which is the 6th of February. And um, look out for the Pony website, and you'll see a wealth of speakers signed up. Um, we're updating one of our 1980s facility packs. Um, with, this is a resources pack aimed very much at school groups, community groups. Um, we'll be looking at nurses as part of the um, Women's International Day. We'll be looking at stories um, about memorial memorialization throughout March. We will we'll, uh, be hosting a big event on the 10th, 25th of April about the 100th anniversary of the RAF. We'll be doing Spanish flu in June and we will mark the general election at uh, some point in December 1918. Um, we've also, um, Williams already, um, I, I don't, don't, William didn't mention this, but um, the Ulster Museum were recently presented with, um, with a box of soil from Racine. 
a few weeks ago and that will be coming here at a later date as well. So, um, do I talk about this now? Yeah, I think so. Okay, right, okay. Masine, this is the collaborative project that we did with, um, uh, with uh, Niall and the, and the Nerve Centre. Um, we decided early on that we wanted to make Masine a fairly, fairly major event. Um, from Pony's point of view, and I mean, this is the one opportunity I think over the war years to mark an event which you know was comfortable with the 16th and 36th divisions, and there was opportunity to bring communities together. Um, there were plans for it to be bigger than that. I, I know that from the, the Northern Ireland First World War community, had great plans, but because of the absence of the government. Um, some of those didn't come to fruition. But from Pony's point of view, we were able to be very collaborative. Um, we made relations, we established a rapport with the government of Flanders, um, and they sent over uh, a curator called Pete Ch Chains, who gave a, a, a presentation um, from a, very much the, the Belgian um, perspective um, of Irish um, regiments fighting for fighting out, out in the scene. Um, he in turn also arranged for um, what were called the assembly chairs, which was a set of five chairs from a church in Passchendaele to come to Crony. Um, and associated with that was a memorial book with the names of everybody who had died from the UK and Ireland. Um, and people were encouraged to sign that book as well. We also had a, a series of lunchtime talks um, in, in joint partnership with the Western Front Association. Um, but probably the most interesting aspect was um, the element that the Nerve Centre brought, and that was um, a comic book um, which um, the Nerve Centre had um, developed. Do you want to start? Yeah, we'll enter that. That's okay, right. sure. And, um, so, now, 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 we brought six different schools in over the course of the Messine period. Um, so that's quite a lot for Prony. We don't tend to have that engagement with school groups. Um, I know the likes of museums and some centre where we would have, certainly have that sort of engagement. So this was very much a triumph, a triumph from our point of view. And so um, we had workshops which Niall did and then um, our staff um, entertained the um, the, the school groups uh, throughout the rest of the building and were ready, they got to see original documents um, and material with, uh, which were written by um, individuals who have cut the of and deposited with Prony. And there's a few examples and um, we do have a representative of the press on um, centre stage. So I'm going to pass over to Niall now. Sure. And uh, thanks Dean. Um, give a little bit of a background. I suppose first and foremost to who we are and why we're, we're doing this kind of work. Um, my name is Niall Kerr, I am uh, project manager at the Nerve Centre. Uh, we, we have a project called Creative Centenaries, which we established a few years ago, uh, partly in response to the, to the lack of direction for a, for a central hub around the decade of centenaries in Northern Ireland. And we, were, we were approached by the then DECAL um, government body to, to establish a platform that people could use as a, as a hub, as a, as a home for the decade of centenaries across Northern Ireland to learn what it was, to find out information about events and resources and all that kind of thing. So I've been asked today to speak specifically about the machine project that we did, but in order to set a little bit of context to that, first of all, we have um, the Nurse Centre does a strong track record in community, like said, community relations and cultural diversity work. Um, and have produced lots of resources and lots of content uh, across various different themes uh, over the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so with Creative Centenaries, we took a very, uh, as the name suggests, creative approach to how we explored the decade of centenaries. Some of the things we, we started off by doing were to create uh, a suite of animations uh, and video content around some of the key points uh, from the decade of centenaries. So we've done one around the decade of centenaries as a whole, around the start of the First World War, Easter Rising, Battle of the Somme, and subsequently the Battle of the Scene. Uh, trying to take archive content and uh, the rich resource material and present it in a new way, represent it for new audiences in a new way and make it much more accessible, particularly for young people. So you'll see we use a method of 2.5D projection, add a colour and try to condense these events down into uh, 4 or 5 minutes. And I challenge anybody to condense these to rise into the Battle of the Song in 4 or 5 minutes uh, in animated form. Uh, but it's an example of the kinds of things we're trying to do to set the scene, set the context for these events. 
Some of the other things we've done, we've uh, developed a suite of interactive iBooks around the decade centenaries, um, which if you go and do a search for 1916 or decade centenaries on the Apple iBooks, the world's now the number one result. It's been downloaded over 6,000 times in the last two years. Uh, just because I suppose with the demand for content and the want of knowledge around 1916. And it takes a, it actually started out life as a, if you remember those things we used to have called CD ROMs back in the past. Um, it still seem like quite a long time ago. Uh, we developed a CD ROM, I think in around 2000, year 2000. Um, and we, we re presented that content in interactive format. Uh, I built it up with an education pack for schools. Uh, it's an interactive resource that, that young people can get involved in, old people, anybody of, of any age, essentially. Uh, one of the things that we've, that most successful things we've done over the last few years is to, be, to produce a suite of graphic novels and comic book stories. These have proved massively successful and massively popular. Um, again, book ended with educational resources and a curriculum linked at Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3 in the Northern Ireland curriculum. But essentially looking at important periods of time during the decade centenaries uh, through the lives of, of real people and real experiences. So looking at the Battle of the Somme and East Rising uh, through the perspectives of real people. Uh, the Lusitania down here, my, my colleagues, great aunt and great great aunt, are the two female characters on the top left there, uh, and then Francis Ledwich and Alison Milligan, the other two. Uh, what we did with these was to, to produce them and print them back to back. Um, so the Easter Rising and the Battle of the Somme, for example, are produced in the one publication back to back. Um, that was uh, <coughs> done deliberately as, as a way to, to encourage people who wouldn't otherwise learn about one of those events to get a chance to learn about them. And we found that by putting those, those comic books into the hands of young people, we might although only have heard one of those stories, we're getting a chance to hear another story. The Lusitania was a standalone uh, publication, and then Francis Ledwich and Alice Milligan were uh, a dual resource as well, printed back to back. And always conscious of telling these stories through real people and real stories, uh, and the balance of both male and female perspectives as well, which I'm, I'm proud to say we've, we've done. Uh, and book ended around all of these, as I say, are educational packs, um, curriculum linked, uh, either Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3, which isn't just to say that they can be used in the classroom. We've been able to use these in adult education programs, community education programs, um, in various different capacities. So here, for example, off the back of reading about the uh, Battle of the Somme, Easter Rising, we've suggested poster making tasks, creative writing tasks. With the Lusitania, we've got everything from investigate the sinking to, 3D, to a 3D model that you can print off the ship, uh, to downloadable 2D animation assets that you can create your own stop motion animation about the sinking. So trying to lead that, that STEM and STEAM agenda in schools and with young people, we were so tech savvy nowadays and what content that relates to them uh, and we found that that's pretty quite popular. And we take those, those resources and that content and get it out in the communities, get it out in the schools. Um, we've been uh, lucky, I suppose, over the last few years to have had the support from the likes of the Department of Communities and Detail as it was to, to produce these, and the Department of Foreign Affairs, HLF, CRC, everyone, to, to produce these resources and get them into the hands of people. Um, and I think in our NXS we've probably produced in excess of 60 or 70,000 copies of the Somme Easter Rising, about 30,000 copies of Lusitania, and about 40 or 50,000 copies of Ledwich and Milligan, uh, and used them across all our programs. So last year, when you mentioned the exhibition that we had at the Ulster Museum, we were able to put these resources in for free, that people can, can lift as they make their way around the exhibition, take them home and learn a bit more. And we've also got a current, current partnership with the National Library of Ireland in Dublin, where all these resources are, are freely accessible there as well. Again, seeing the demand, right across the country and right across the island for people to, to access these, these resources and use them. Um, off the back of that, we're then able to go out into the community. So last year we did a huge community engagement program, an education program for young people and adults. Uh, so we're able to use these resources and the suggested digital tasks and interactive tasks that are built around them to, to, to allow a new audience to, to learn about these events. So top left, this was a group in Dublin who were using uh, 2D animation, stop motion 2D animation. Uh, around the Battle of the Somme. <coughs> Talk about it's a film making program with cross community schools coming together to make uh, little short creative response films to important people in the decades and theories. Bottom right is we're starting to use virtual reality as a tool to engage people to put them into the perspectives of these situations. Uh, and bottom left was a, a comic book project that we did with <coughs> schools in Donegal. Uh, again, uh, using, always trying to use digital, always trying to use interactive, always trying to use new methods as ways of engagement around, around what, what can be contentious history sometimes. Uh, and wasn't through this as quickly as possible because I'm, I'm Battle of Messines. Much is coming very soon. Uh, Carol, hope you don't mind me showing this. We, uh, we worked uh, in partnership with, uh, with Carol at the Somme Museum uh, earlier this year to produce uh, another one of these animations around the Battle of Messines. Uh, and I was just speaking actually to a couple of colleagues earlier this week who were saying they're still continuing to use this because it's available for free online. 
they're still using it in an education program right across Northern Ireland. Uh, again, it's using that, that same method of 2.5D projection and bringing old archive imagery to life and presenting it in new ways for new audiences uh, and it formed part of, of Carl's exhibition at the museum and we've also then used it across all of our programs too and it's freely accessible for anybody to do so. Um, again, within not through. Uh, we've since uh, talked specifically about the project we're here today. We have produced a comic book uh, this year around the Battle of the Scenes and I'm pleased to say there's one for everybody in the audience. Uh, I've got a box sitting underneath this table at the back, so I'll be sure to get a bit at this talk. Uh, but again, it conscious that we don't want to just focus on, on one person or one story. It's book ended with uh, the story of Kathleen Lynn, who was a uh, quite famous uh, female nurse, suffragette, sort of, sort of uh, involved in the rising, involved in, in politics uh, generally across the end of the world. So it's a book ending um, what was going on at the Western Front, what was going on at the home front at that time, and, and trying to get across those both perspectives and both, uh, both stories. Uh, in doing so, in producing the Battle of, of the Scenes, uh, these are quite short comic book stories. The Battle of the Scenes is only eight pages, but it's about giving people an, an intro point and allowing them to go out and find out their own information thereafter. We're able to, we were quite pleased that we were able to use archive content. So here, for example, uh, is a map of the machines there that Prony had in their collections, which we then were able to take and one of our comic book pages, put it in as a comic book format. So it's referencing back all the time to this rich archive content that exists. And then hopefully that encourages people then to see that the Prony's content has been used. I will encourage them to go to Prony, to go to museums, go to libraries and find out more and whatever it might be. And similarly, with the Kathleen Lynn story, um, working with the National Library of Ireland, <coughs> excuse me, they were quite keen or I'm really asked you to be pleased to see that some of the content that they've in their collections, this poster for example, uh, was, was put into this format and allowed them to get their content, content out in ways that they hadn't been able to do before. And around all of that, we book in some, some educational resources. So I don't give we don't mind, we've, we've encouraged people to go on a search for your uh, uh, non-commercial images to use uh, to make a little film about the battle machines. Or about, is it machines or machine? I always get confused. Um, so again, some suggested digital tasks that can, can be completed in the classroom. This one's producing a short film. There's so, so much rich content out there. Uh, a recorded a radio news broadcast. We're trying to put young people into perspectives of these people in these situations and trying to encourage them to think creatively about, about, about that time. Schools uh, and, and young people obviously are so tech savvy and they're, 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 they need this, they, these kinds of resources, they need these, these kinds of tasks and I suppose in order to keep young people interested in, in all, of, all this content uh, and have the resources mostly within schools to do this. So that's why we, 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 we suggest these kind of digital tasks and we found that research has proven uh, certainly through our programs that young people are engaging with this content in ways that they didn't before by using digital. So, Stephen, we got back, we got together um, early this year uh, and produced a, a series of workshops, free digital workshops for schools around the centenary of the Battle of the Saints, encouraged it, promoted it as wide as we could, and we're delighted then to, to welcome various groups to, to Chrome here uh, for those workshops. Uh, and as Stephen said, part of it was that they come in, they could see the exhibition, they could see the assembly chairs, you can see that, that, that book. They could tour Chrome's archives, so they got to see that map that I showed you earlier on, uh, and then we brought them in here into this room. Um, and, and we, we did a, a, a workshop based around digital comic book storytelling uh, mixed with an element of green screen, which is this rather strange looking image here being the site. Uh, so again, as a tool of engagement, and as a, a way of, of engaging people around this content, especially young people, we found with these young people that they didn't even know what the battle of scenes or scene was before they came into this room. There hadn't been much understanding, or it has much understanding as it had been around the song the year previously. So uh, it was a way for them to engage around content that they hadn't otherwise heard about before or necessarily seen before. So over the course of a two-hour workshop, after those little trips around Tony itself, we brought them in here, we gave them a copy of the comic book, <coughs> they were the first people to get their hands on those comic books, uh, and then we, we talked them through and then through a process where they would create their own short comic book stories about the battle, re representing that to themselves, but also using an element of green screen technology to send themselves back in time and become characters in their own stories. So the results aren't always perfect, uh, in two hours, we're not going to get uh, a masterpiece. So this one says the Battle of Messiness over here, uh, <laughs> which is uh, a common mistake and a common thing that seemed to run through it. But it's, it's a, bit, a way for them to express themselves creatively and to produce something that they can then take back to the classroom, take home, print out, put on the wall, and feed a sense of ownership over. And the element of green screen technology that we had then, so this, for example, this is two characters who pretended to be John Meek and Molly Redmond, who were the two characters in our comic book story here. So we got them thinking personally about those people their perspectives, what they were doing, and what they might have been going through at that time. There's a little short video with BBC, as, as uh, Stephen said, come out and, and filmed. 
Uh, it's only been I think a minute and a half, so I'm over slightly over time, if you don't mind. Um, you have been given a modern makeover for school children. Disregard my comments. Form of a comic book. The value of scenes is quite significant for us here, obviously because the 36th Ulster Division and the 16th Irish Division went into battle side by side for the first time during the First World War. So the symbolism of that is quite significant. The new comic book, the new graphic novel we've developed around the battle of scenes looks at the role of Willie Redmond, the MP, James MC MP, uh, and John Meek, the orangeman from Battle Money in County Adam, and uh, how they came together on the battle field, how Meek and Mr. James Redmond. So it's a story about coming together. But these 14 year old pupils from St. Rose's and Corpus Christi schools in West Belfast are going a step further than just reading about the battle. They're creating their own graphic stories about the events at the scene. They've been taking part in special classes at the Public Record Office in Belfast, where Caitlin and Chloe have stepped back in time. The student from the Green Screen, and what it did was put a photo of the battle of the scene behind us, so it looked like we were actually there. I've made a comic on the battle of the scene, and like, it's like a storyboard. And Fergal says what they're doing really does bring history closer to home. In school, this tax group do this, do that, and here it's just really put pictures to the screen and make up like a script. I think it's sort of your imagination and history to get. So 21st century technology is giving him and his fellow pupils a graphic experience of the past. Robbie Meredith, BBC Newsline. So that's it. Feedback from that was quite good. Young people were able to, to express themselves. You hear uh, imagination and history coming together, which I thought was quite a nice line. Um, that's a, a whistle stop tour of that. I hope that made some sense. And Stephen Sorry, I can't talk over there as well. If there's any questions? for having me today. Uh, so my role is Public Engagement Officer for Lives of the First World War and the War Memorial Register. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about Lives of the First World War. But firstly what I'd like to do is put the project within the context of the Imperial War Museum's history. Indeed to develop an understanding of why indeed we are doing this project. So to kick off, the Imperial War Museum was founded in March 1917. So this was during the war, whilst the First World War was still being fought, it was recognised that the toil and sacrifice of individuals from Britain and the Commonwealth should be represented and reflected in a national museum. So what happened was, on the right hand side here, we have a call to action. So a call for contribution of photographs, objects and stories. This was in a ration book, so really emphasising the, the call to the civilians and indeed you know, the wider, wider population to share their stories with the museum so they could be preserved for future generations. And you have uh, these individuals here who were the founders of the Imperial War Museum. So second from the left we have Martin Conway, who was our first chairman. With a wonderful moustache we have Alfred Mond, who was the first director. And then over on the right hand side in the foreground we have Charles Fox, who was the first curator of the Imperial War Museum. So what happened? Charles Fox, as our first curator, went out to the Western Front and talked to people who were fighting there and asked them what object represents your experience? You know, what would you want to see in a museum to represent you know, the situation that you're experiencing now? And this is over in Heston, so this was effectively our first depot and our first collection storage units. Uh, so you've got material and objects here that were effectively allocated to be remembered um, in the museum when it was finally set up. So you've got signs, you've got armour, you've got weapons and all sorts of objects to really reflect the everyday experience of warfare in that respect. You've also got this wonderful woman, Agnes Conway, so, Liz mentioned earlier about the Women's Work Collection, and Agnes Conway, who was the daughter of Martin Conway in the previous photograph, she was called upon to set up the Women's Work Subcommittee to represent women's experience of warfare, as indeed has been mentioned, you know, women were involved in all sorts of important work contributed to the war effort, from munitions to working on the land and the agriculture to all sorts of industries. And it was recognised at that time, in 1917, that it was really crucial that women were remembered alongside men in terms of contribution. 
And we have here an exhibition that the Women's Work Subcommittee pulled together in Whitechapel. Mm -hmm. And all these wonderful objects that Liz was talking about. So we have depictions here of women in nursing, uh, women in different industries, <coughs> and all sorts of objects and paintings calling other individuals to contribute for the collection. Which is where Lives of the First World War comes in. Lives of the First World War is the Imperial War Museum's permanent digital memorial to 7.7 .7 million individuals. And these individuals contributed to the war effort. So they're from Britain and the Commonwealth, and they contributed in all sorts of ways, be it you know, through, through munitions work, be it as a Chinese labour corps individual, or indeed armed service, all sorts of experiences. And what I've done here is pulled together some of the photographs from the Imperial War Museum's collection that are now shared on Lives of the First World War. So it's a lovely opportunity for the museum to showcase its collection, as well as call upon the wider public to, to share information. So these 7.7 .7 million life stories, we really rely on members of the public to share photographs, connect official records, and stories that you come across, so that we can preserve this, this material for future generations to come. And a fantastic way that we can do that is connecting these official records to an individual's life story. And we've got 487 million records accessible through, this, through the site. So the way that it works is we are supported by Find My Pass. So effectively, they look after the website and we look after the content and the engagement in that respect. So these records, some of them might be familiar as I talk through them if you have ever used Find My Pass in that respect. So 7.8 million of these records are free which means that anyone can use them, you know, use them for your own projects, but indeed to share them with the project. And then the, the rest of those are behind a paywall of £6 a month or £50 a year, uh, which then enables you to access those. And to talk you through them, so some of the free records that we have, uh, for example, the Cyril Pierce's Conscientious Objectors Register is a record of 17,000 individuals who were registered COs in the First World War, a story that is sometimes neglected when we talk about the wider picture, but indeed at the forefront of our minds in this project. And we've got, like I said, the wider Commonwealth experience represented as well, so New Zealand in the Great War, and all sorts of fantastic records that give us access to these different stories. In terms of the military records, and like I said, these are behind a paywall, um, but these are really, really brilliant. Um, and just to pull out a couple of examples, some of them are regimental based. So we've got the Honourable Artillery Company records on here. We've got Abingdon, 1914 to 1920, which is in Oxfordshire, so brilliant for local history research. Um, and indeed, British Army Service records, you can access them through here also. Of course, it's really important for us to acknowledge that many civilians were affected by the war and contributed to the war as well. As has been mentioned, we're talking about Zeppelin raids. People who were victims of these atrocities are also remembered. And we've got civilian records to support research as well, including census records, which of course help us all to develop a wider understanding <coughs> of individuals' experience. We also have our history page. Um, if any of you have ever used service records or any kind of documents 100 years old, sometimes you need a little bit of help deciphering abbreviations um, and, and things like that. So this page is really designed to give uh, broader, um, you know, broader clues and signposts to information to perhaps contextualise your own research as you're undertaking it. So what happens is, Anyone can set up a free page, a free account on Lives of the First World War. It will always be free to contribute your research to it, and indeed to browse the material that's already been shared. So you can do so by creating your own page, and this is mine. And you can do so either as an individual, or you can do it as an organisation. So you put your, your name, a photograph for yourself, or to represent your organisation, and then a bit about what you're interested in. And indeed, that's a lovely way for you to signpost to perhaps a website that you're running, or indeed further information and personal details, so that if someone has a look at your profile, they can then get in touch with you and perhaps share some material. The remembering function I will talk about in a moment, but effectively what you can see here are all of the life stories that I have contributed to in some way or another on the page. And then communities on the right hand side, which again I shall elaborate on. So these 7.7 .7 million individuals are represented by a life story page. 
And I pulled up one as an example here. Of course, I've cherry picked a really beautiful one with lots of pictures, um, but just bear with me. So, what we've got is the name at the top there, the ability to add the date of birth and date of death when known. And here we have the way that this individual contributed to the war. So, here was with the Royal Irish Rifles, and we have his service number here. So the site works by signposting to evidence at every opportunity. In order to add facts, you must first connect the piece of evidence or the story that you found it, and by effectively how is this thing known. So it's really crucial that every, every signpost is made to the original source, source of material, so that when someone else is looking at your research, they can see why you know this thing to be correct. So we've got here a timeline of facts that have been added based on said, said evidence. So we've got here, this is Lieutenant Harold Oliver, who was born in Hollington in Sussex in 1885 to, Char to Charlotte and Jesse William Oliver. And we've got a wonderful photograph here. So this is his wife. Harold Oliver married Anne Rafferty in 1914. So we're not just interested in someone's experience of the First World War. Indeed, it's really crucial that we develop as broad an understanding and appreciation of their story of the entirety of their life and indeed post-war stories, you know, that's a fantastic resource for us to be able to explore and discuss further what happened when these individuals came home. <coughs> so we've got the timeline, we then have the facts, the pieces of evidence, stories, and then we have 11 images on this particular record. And then on the right hand side you have contributors, it's really crucial that as an individual who's using the facts, you can see that effectively we're acknowledging what you're sharing with us because it's fantastic for example, when you go onto a life story page that perhaps hasn't had anyone else work on it, but one person who shares a surname with the life story that you're looking at, and you're then able to understand who's remembering these individuals and why, you know, why as a community are some individuals being researched whilst perhaps others aren't so much. <coughs> so the remembering function at the top there, that's a way to indicate that you're working on a story, that you're interested in the story, and that then puts the person into your dashboard, so that when you log on, you can navigate to their page more easily. And we've got latest records over on the right-hand side as well, so that's material that's already been connected. Uh, so this is under the facts, and facts are broken down into <coughs> name, birth, age, and death, family and civilian, and military service. And you can, see, you can see here that Howard Oliver enlisted in Belfast, in 1903, so a pre-war soldier here. And we've got that he, he was a regular soldier and he received a commission in 1917. We've then got the pieces of evidence. And you can see this individual who shares the surname has added the death certificate for this man's son uh, and indeed a biography from an external website. So a lovely opportunity to signpost to resources that you've already created or that you're already aware of not solely through the official record channels that we have here. And this is the gold dust, isn't it? This is exactly what you want to see being shared, something that might otherwise be in an attic or just be known to local, you know, to the family, immediate family. It's exactly this thing that effectively is the reason that we established this project, to share these stories more broadly and to ensure that these wonderful photographs and anecdotes about social history and families and communities are shared and remembered for future generations. So we've got some wonderful photographs here of Howard in his uniform, one of whom in later life, which is effectively his profile picture up here, one with his wife and their son, and indeed a family photograph post-war. So that's my message really, you know, when you're looking at these fantastic photographs, I really would encourage you, if you're exploring stories related to individuals who have a connection to the First World War, share it, because, you know, if we all do this, then what a fantastic resource that we can create, and what a wonderful legacy of the research that we're all doing during the centenary period. So I put out a couple of um, more local stories as well, just to demonstrate some different functionalities. And thank you to Victoria for nicely sharing this earlier. So this is a community, which is an opportunity to connect different life stories together. And I've got a couple of examples which I'm talking through. So we've got the Ulster War Race here, so War Dead, buried in the nine counties of Ulster which has been set up by Austin Wargroves. So they've effectively set up, this project has set up their own profile, which nicely signposts to their website for individuals with an interest in these graves to go onto their website for further information. And they've added photographs of the Wargroves. 
But indeed, you can see that there are other photographs that have been shared, you know, of the individuals themselves. And but also important to note, we're never going to be complete with this. You know, you have some without photographs. It's very much a collaborative crowdfunding project. Uh, so crowd, you know, funding of information. So you know, even if you look at a page and you think, well, for now, and surely there's nothing I can add there. There's always material that's coming to light, and indeed, that I'm sure is coming to light through your own research that hasn't been looked at before during this period. We've got here Jesuit chaplains in the First World War, a community with the help of the IAR project team. The intention is to remember the 32 Jesuit chaplains of the Irish province who served in the First World War. Not something you might immediately think of in terms of First World War research, but it's a lovely example of how these stories can be connected and indeed shared with wider community. And it's a nice platform as well for research groups to go away and demonstrate in terms of legacy of your own projects. Uh, Castleton Lantern, the men of Castleton Presbyterian Church in Belfast. And we've got some fantastic photographs um, that has been shared on these live story pages. And again, indeed, signposting through to the, the local project. Um, a nice way of doing so. And we've even got class me at, uh, sorry, tweet me at classy jeans. So, you know, a nice example of how actually this can be a platform for you to share your research and also, you know, broader engagement as well. And then, with slightly with my other memorials hat on, we have a community here to the Northern Bank War Memorials. So the bank officials from either the Belfast Banking Company or the Northern Banking Company, whose names appear on their respective memorials. And this is in um, Belfast, obviously over here. And someone's put their email address in. And we get wonderful emails and anecdotes of people who've added their information, indeed their Twitter handles, their address, whatever it is. And then they've been contacted by people who've stumbled across their page when they're doing a Google search or browsing through the website. And they've been able to share that material with them. So, lovely platform in that respect. And I'd just like to finish by showing you one of my favourite photographs of soldiers from the First World War. This is why we all do what we do, isn't it? You know, it's bringing these stories to life and making sure that we remember these individuals. And if the legacy of life of the First World War can be to you know, put a face and a story to a surname and initial on a war memorial, or to fill in some of the blanks in a question, over a question mark in someone's family tree, then to my mind that will be a legacy job well done. So just to encourage you really to you know, share your research, it's a platform for you to undertake research, but also to share what you're doing so that we can all you know, discover these stories and remember the individuals. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thanks very much, Pamela and colleagues, for organising this, and to Prony uh, for, for hosting it. It's always a fantastic place to come, isn't it, folks? Um, it's, a, it's a great resort that we're happy in Belfast uh, to come to, uh, not only in terms of the archives, of course, but in, in terms of the facilities that we enjoy uh, here. Um, I've been so impressed so far this morning and early this afternoon, actually. I'm sure everybody in the room has, really. There's so much going on, isn't there? There's just so much going on. Uh, and there's so many great projects. Uh, HMS Caroline is just outstanding. The Woodlands Trust, the Weeping Poppies, uh, the Nerve Centre, all of these probably work. We really should be really proud, I think, actually, uh, to have had so many great, and to still continue to have um, so many great projects, uh, and projects which are cooking up, like Ballykinler Hut, which we heard about from Mike earlier. You know, these sorts of initiatives uh, are really inspiring, uh, and it makes me just think, actually, maybe in 2018, we should really be making sure that we speak to as wide an audience as possible uh, to celebrate um, I know we're not celebrating the war, we're commemorating the war, but in terms of what we have achieved through that commemoration process, I think ought to be celebrated. Because it's a major achievement uh, for, smudge, for, for such a small part um, of these islands, as we have here, a population of just 1.5 million, but to have achieved so much, we definitely punch above our weight. I say we, and obviously from my accent, I'm not a local. But I feel part of the, the local uh, environment uh, and they've been made more so through my involvement 
uh, with the commemoration of uh, the First World War through an initiative which was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is uh, one of the UK research councils which gathers money from you, the UK taxpayer, assuming you're paying taxes, <laughs> I'll make that assumption, um, and the RC UK, the organisation, divides up that huge pot of cash and it gives a very small amount of money to the Arts and the Humanities. And the Arts and Humanities Research Council, they gave us a very small amount of money to universities like Queen's University, Belfast, and the university I'm from. Um, to do interesting things. And some of that money came our way in 2014 to create what's called a public engagement centre. And Living Legacies 1914-18 for Past Conflict to Shared Future is one of five public engagement centres around the UK. The other four are all in England, uh, primarily in the south of England, if you draw a line between um, the, uh, the Humber and the, uh, and the Severn. Uh, like south east of that line is where the other centres lie. So Living Legacy is the only one, as it were, outside England certainly, and, and, uh, and sort of and more distant, <coughs> far from places. Um, and, but as part of this um, grouping of centres, these five centres, we have a particular interest um, in how the past can be used to create a better future, simply. Uh, and it fits a lot with what we've been hearing earlier from um, what William talked about, for example, weeping poppies and um, the other kinds of initiatives which have been cross-community driven. Um, the Community Relations Council, of course, you know, all the kind of really good work that's been going on. And we fit into that quite complicated, quite busy landscape. So what I want to do very briefly now is explain what we might bring or what we hope we can bring to the table, so to speak, in this very busy landscape of what's going on. And there's a number of you from different organisations here. Uh, for different groups, uh, obviously with different interests and with different kinds of expertise, and we're part of that. So, um, Living Legacies is an engagement centre, it's funded by the HRC, it's funded from 2014 through to 2019. We were very fortunate last year to get further funding from the HRC. Uh, we had three years funding initially granted to us, and now we have a further three, three years funding through to the end of 20, 2019, so that's six years in total. So we were new to this landscape in 2014 and it's taken obviously a little while for us to find out <coughs> and for you to get to know us and for us to find out what we're all doing. But what we can, what we can contribute, I think, uh, most of all, is providing, as it says in the programme here, a kind of bridge, really, between the academic world, which is often seen as something which is quite distant anyway, but the academic world on the one hand and all its busy researchers, historians, <coughs> geographers, archaeologists, all those specialists, and another very kind of busy world and productive world, community researchers, for want of a better term. You know, those people who spend their, the people who we've just been hearing about in terms of those contributors to the LIES project, you know, volunteer researchers from the communities that we all live in and are part of, uh, putting their time and effort and energy into something that they are really interested and passionate about. So we've got two different research worlds. One is a very much a kind of community-based, informal kind of sector, and one is a university research world, which is very formalised. And these engagement centres are meant to try and bridge that gap. And there are ways we can do that, and all I'm going to do now is explain some of the ways we can begin to try and do that. Um, so my name, I didn't say at the start, my name is Keith Lilly. I'm the director or principal investigator uh, for uh, Living Legacies. Uh, I'm a historical geographer, that's my, that's my trade. Um, that's what I do, I teach historical geography, I'm interested in maps and landscapes and I've been working for about 19 years at Queen's uh, teaching students on those sorts of things. <coughs> um, the sort of context then, uh, I, I suppose, for us and the engagement centres is kind of summarised, particularly for Living Legacies, around these sorts of points. Um, you know, we are interested in heritage and heritage is the living past. It's not, we're not interested necessarily in history for the sake of history. It's not simply an academic project. It's about heritage. It's about how the past lives on in the present. And of course, when it comes to the First World War, it's a very difficult, troubled past that lives on in the present and has a particular resonance that we need to be respectful of. Um, and at the same time, that provides us with an interesting focus for our research. You know, it's almost like Northern Ireland is this curiosity uh, where we can begin to explore some of these difficult issues about how past relates to present. So those kinds of questions that you see there on the screen are the sort of research questions that we in the university sector might be interested in and are interested in exploring through this engagement with the wider public. 
The uh, engagement centres are funded, as I mentioned, by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, but they're also very closely linked to the Heritage Lottery Fund's <coughs> First, War, First World War, then and now funding programme. And Jimmy is going to be talking, I think, is it Jimmy? He's going to be talking a bit later on about the HLF First World War, then and now funding programme, which is resourcing communities, empowering communities to do research. And then what we want to do through Living Legacies is build that bridge with those communities and do things together. Uh, hopefully in interesting kinds of ways. We're part of the IWM Centenary Partnerships, of course, and we're also part of the HRC's Connected Communities Programme. Um, we're a hub in a wider world. So although Living Legacy is based at Queen's University of Belfast, it is closely interconnected with uh, the nations within the nation, in inverted commas. Um, so we have very close connections with Wales uh, and colleagues in Wales and, and in Scotland and also in the northeast of England. Uh, as well as here uh, on the island of Ireland. So, so we are a hub in many ways, and we stretch out to other parts of these islands. Uh, and we fit into that sort of, as I mentioned a moment ago, the First World Then and Now program, we sort of fit into that funding landscape of trying to engage uh, and empower local communities to do uh, interesting things, to learn about the past in the context of the present. So what are we trying to do? We're linking ac academic community researchers, Co-produced research, I think, was mentioned by William earlier on this morning. This is simply a way, of, as a mechanism, for ensuring that research, when we do it, is done in a kind of collaborative way. So we don't end up in all these silos, all right, not talking to each other. So we've got different communities, and we come together, and we do research together. Uh, and the engagement centres provide practical support, as you'll see uh, in a minute. And we try and build partnerships. We're not saying we're going to do all the work for you, because we don't have that capacity but we think we can find mechanisms to make it happen. We might have some resource, we might have some expertise which we can bring to the table, which is otherwise difficult to get because universities are well resourced, even though they complain, obviously, they're not well resourced, but they really are, okay? Uh, we have a lot of expertise. That doesn't say we, have, we don't have all the answers, but we might know a few questions, and we might be able to talk about those questions in relation to the kind of questions that others have. <coughs> Why are we going to do this? Because at the end of the day, we think it's a good thing, basically. You know, we get a <coughs> richer understanding and assessment of the past and its context in the present. Lots of logos, um, a wall of logos, uh, to kind of indicate really how interconnected we are. Um, Living Legacies has research themes. Uh, we specialise in three different sort of areas, broadly speaking. The top one there is called Critical Commemoration and Creative Practice. We have a good amount of experience and expertise in thinking creatively. It kind of links back to what Niall was talking about earlier. Uh, thinking creatively and dealing creatively, especially say through drama, performance, um, story writing, storytelling. Um, so think about those sorts of methods to reflect more critically uh, on commemoration itself. Material cultures and landscapes, we have a lot of suspicion of expertise in looking at the materiality of the war itself and the legacies of that materiality in the landscape and how we might use archaeological methods and, di and uh, digital methods to visualise and engage with that past. And talking of digitalisation, we also have a specialism in digital heritage and engagement, which again speaks actually to some what Niall was talking about. You know, we have green screen technologies and those sorts of things and capacity for building websites and so forth. So these, sorts, these are our research themes, and they interconnect with these broader organisations, and we try and link across the programmes which are being run by these, by these other organisations. So for example, just to pick out one there, the Council for British Archaeology has a programme called Homefront Legacy, which is a crowdsourcing platform to engage local people to get an interest in, in First World War archaeology. Um, and we're working with the CPA to run workshops, to build capacity in the community, to find out more about this sort of hidden heritage in the world around us and feed that through. But there's lots of different examples of that. If I, if I had an hour, I would talk you through those, but I, I don't. How it's organised, there's me uh, trying to kind of coordinate things and I speak to the engagement centres. We all have our different specialisms. Uh, we have a great project manager, Elaine Reed, who kind of keeps me, keeps me on track, brilliant. Uh, Sophie Long, who you're going to hear from in a minute, is, is uh, funded through Living Legacies, in part at least, um, and kind of keeps things kind of moving, so it's kind of the glue really that keeps things stuck together. <coughs> and then we have a raft of project officers, um, so uh, Michelle is here as well, you'll hear from Michelle in, in, a, in a minute, as well as from Sophie, and they all have their specialisms. Some of them are postdoctoral students, some of them are doctoral students. 
um, and some of them are uh, MA students and so forth, but they're, they're researchers, they have a lot of expertise. And then we have academic researchers uh, like me and my colleagues, and we look after these various uh, themes, which I've just mentioned. So Joanne Devlin Truth at the University of Ulster, Kurt Taroff is at Queen's, Elizabeth Crook is at the University of Ulster, Gethin Matthews is at the University of Swansea, Paul L is at Queen's, and Lorna Hughes is at the University of Glasgow. So we have these different locations, but common themes. Okay. So let's say you have uh, connections with a community group. What can we do for that community group? I mean, the first thing I would suggest, since we've been in, in business now for four years nearly, is to have a look at our website, because our website is this constantly evolving thing. It's a massive resource. Um, so it's a sort of dashboard type thing here where if you want to find out information about getting funding, um, digital resources or events and news, that's a way, it's a lot of portal. Um, and, and it kind of reflects obviously a lot of what's going on in this part of the world, because we're very well connected uh, here in, in Northern Ireland. So that would be the first port of, port of call. These are the kinds of things we have been doing for four years now. Roadshows, workshops, different kinds of outreach events, excavations at Ballykinla. Mike, uh, where's Mike gone? Uh, so we've been Montgomery has been involved in excavating, um, in a, I think up one or two years ago, community excavation, Ballykinla uh, camp. I was kind of expect, expecting and anticipating there might be some folks in the audience from community organisations. So I thought, you know, I'd have a slide in here which just says, okay, you know, we're open for business. Um, these are the sorts of things we can do for your World War One project. But let's say, for example, you're, you're involved in an organisation which then links to community organisations. Please pass the message on that these are the sorts of things that we can be doing. We, can have, we have workshops. Um, they can be tailored to the project. We have particular workshops on, on certain topics. War memorials, we've, we've talked to the War Memorials Trust. We've also talked to the Imperial Wars, War Museum on War Memorials. Uh, we can help collaborate with specialist researchers, uh, provide technical advice that might be things like archaeological research, might be things like digitization. And at the end of the day, the idea here is that this can all help that researcher we're doing in the community, that you're doing in the community, to go a bit further and to connect through these different scales, from the local to the regional to the national to the international. So the learning research itself might be quite grassroots. What we're saying is it could be of international significance. And the Living Legacy Centre is a way of making that connection between these different spatial scales. I'm a geographer, right? So I always think in terms of spatial scales, making these connections from the local to the regional to the national to the international. Some examples, very briefly, of the kind of work we've been doing, but also looking forward, because here we are in the end of 2017, uh, 2018, we've got funding until 2019, uh, but 2018 is going to be a really significant year. Um, within the context of the century and the First World War, but within the decade of centenaries, of course, it's what but one year. Uh, so, remembering 1916, William Blair mentioned this this morning. This was a fantastic, uh, very, we, we started this in 2015 through our community outreach program of gathering and harnessing uh, community content, really, basically objects that people have in their attics. We heard that mentioned a moment ago. <laughs> yes, photographs, whatever they may be, or objects, interesting things and stories, particularly the stories around those objects. So we had a, uh, an outreach program working through NMNI, NMNI, one of our very close strategic partners. And then the, the kind of the end result of this was this co-curated exhibition, which Fiona Byrne uh, with <coughs> NMNI and William Blair helped facilitate for us um, on, on the Battle of the Somme and also on these three. So that was a fantastic <coughs> example of the kind of thing we can achieve if we work together, okay, through our community outreach and the big, and the big stakeholders. We're also uh, very interested in looking forward to 2018 um, of trying to encourage more engagement around hidden heritage, especially. So there are aspects of the, um, if you like, the living legacies of the First World War, which have been slightly overlooked and one of those areas, I think, is, is the built heritage or the, the landscape heritage. Um, so we've got this crowdsourcing platform, which we created with the Department for Communities, the Historic Environment Division. This is being relaunched in January in 2018. Uh, and we're going to run a series of workshops with the Department for Communities and also through the Council for British Archaeology to try and get local people more engaged in the surroundings and the localities and the heritage of, not just the first war actually, this goes right the way through to the modern day, but it's a resource for capturing information. And for 2018, they're kind of linked to that, one of the significant areas or gaps, if you like, in that sort of landscape of First World War kind of heritage 
is aviation heritage. We've heard a lot so far through the last uh, few years of the centenary about the great land battles, understandably. You know, Somme, Passchendaele, Messina, etc. A lot, understandably. You know, they loom large in our popular imagination. We've heard actually quite a lot about naval battles and naval heritage, and again, understandably, for good reason. But I think actually aviation heritage has been rather overlooked and totally <coughs> neglected, actually. And we've been working with the Australian Aviation Society and, and Guy and, and Ernie, many, uh, many of you will know Guy and Ernie, uh, and also the RAF as well. I was up at the RAF Aldergrove on Sunday talking to um, cadet uh, squadron leaders about the possibilities for 2018 of working together with living legacies. The cadets, young people, cross community, interest in aviation, obviously, because that's why they're cadets. And, you know, possibly interest in the localities that they live in. And that unlocking the potential there of exciting these younger people, at the same time unlocking the hidden heritage in the landscape. Those aerodromes, those airship stations, those facilities associated um, with the early RAF uh, in, in Northern Ireland, uh, and Ireland more generally actually, um, in 1918. So I think there's a lot of work, interesting work to be done there. And the RAF have got this program, and part of it is for RAF 100 Inspire. And RAF 100 Inspire is really about community engagement. It's a real massive opportunity for us, I think, for 2018, um, to, to try and engage with that program. Um, and there's a scout batch that they've introduced with the scouting association, with the scouting tizzy associations, yeah, um, which is about aviation heritage, researching aviation heritage. It's absolutely right on the money for us. So let's get those young cadets engaged and getting them out in the field. And this is, I think, a way to do that. So what are we going to do next? This depends on who you are, where you come from. But for your, if you're from a community group, please email us or phone us. We're based at Queen's University. You know, we're just up the road here. Uh, but we can come and see you, you know. So, you know, if you're not that mobile, you can, it's difficult to get to Queen's, whatever. Parking's a nightmare. We all know, know that man, South Belfast. So, you know, we, we can jump on a train or whatever it is, and we can come and see you uh, to see what we can achieve by working together. For the heritage stakeholders and organisations, as we've seen, we're doing, we're doing a lot of work uh, with organisations like MNI and Crony and so forth. Um, but, you know, there's more, more we can do there. Uh, by sharing our expertise and unlocking that, I think. And for the government bodies, um, the Department for Communities, local government bodies as well, councils, there's lots of things that we can begin to do as well. Because actually we have a common agenda, don't we really? Which is about building stronger communities and making these sorts of connections. So there we are. I'm gonna, I've probably talked way too much. And it's really much more important that you get to hear from the kinds of projects that we link with which is what you're going to hear about next. Okay, so please get in touch. Thank you very much.